and this is Gund and others, or Gund, I guess, uh, and others, versus the Planning Board of Cambridge and others. Now, I know that uh, there was a, a request made uh, for some uh, recording of the argument, which, which is fine in accordance with the rule. But what I ask is that, however, uh, the person that's doing the recording has got to remain in the same location throughout the course of the argument so that it doesn't disrupt uh, counsel or the court. All right, good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Mark Bobrowski, and I represent the plaintiffs' appellants, Hawley, Gunn, Sococho, and Summons. All of them are neighbors to what is the Sullivan Building, also known as the Middlesex County Courthouse. We all agree, all parties agree, because we had a statement of agreed facts, that the Sullivan, Sullivan Building was constructed in the late 1960s by the county, that at the time the Cambridge Zoning Ordinance had a... By the way, uh, pardon me for interrupting, but um, because time is so short, you can assume we've uh, reviewed the briefs, understand the facts. In fact, in this case, I'll add that we appreciate the extent to which everyone has worked hard to distill this down to a question of law. So if you want to get right to that, I think it would be most productive. Thank you, Your Honor. The question of law in this case is what provision of the Cambridge Zoning Ordinance applies to the Sullivan Building after it was decommissioned when the last prisoner left in 2014. Can There's I just ask you to speak up a little bit? Sure. There's a fundamental disagreement between the parties. They and the City of Cambridge uh, in particular says that it became a non-conforming structure. That would be governed by Section 6 of the Zoning Act and by Section 8.22.2 of the Cambridge Zoning Ordinance. The plaintiff appellants think it did not qualify as a non-conforming structure. Instead, it's a non-compliant structure, but one beyond the statute of limitations and immune from zoning enforcement. It would require, however, a variance in order to modify the structure, as proposed by Leggett McCall, the purchaser of the building from DCAM. And uh, again, pardon me for interrupting, but what would be helpful to us also, I think, is if you could address yourself at least uh, for a few moments to the legislation that's been called to our attention. I will, I will uh, do so. Number one, uh, do you regard it as effective as of today? And number two, what effect, if any, does it have on this case? Well, uh, if I might, Your Honor, I'll defer that, but I will answer your question because I think it fits nicely into the point where uh, if I'm, I've made my ultimate point. I think it confirms my point, so I want to save it for then. Cambridge Zoning Ordinance defines non-conforming structure at Section 2. It says any structure which does not conform to the dimensional requirements or to the parking and loading requirements of this ordinance for the district in which it's located, provided that such structure was in existence and lawful at the time the applicable provisions of this or prior zoning ordinances became effective. That's a classic definition, to use the words of Justice Cass and Mendes versus Barnstable, of a non-conforming structure. It was lawful when created because it conformed or it preceded zoning, and then the zoning changed. It rendered it, as a result, non-conforming. That definition appears in the Cambridge Zoning Ordinance, and it was ignored by the land court. The well, th that, uh, you may disagree with the reasoning of the land court, but the judge didn't ignore it. Well, he said that he, it He attempted didn't to reconcile Section 2 and Section 8 with Chapter 40A, Section 6. I don't know that he went to the extent of trying to reconcile it with, ch with Section 8. He said he conceded that it did not appear to meet the literal definition of lawful nonconforming structure with regard to the FAR limit. And my point is that literal doesn't matter. It's lawful definition. Cambridge zoning has spoken through this definition, and you don't get to ignore it simply because it's inconvenient in this instant matter because of a government building. So you, it appears that you're relying primarily, correct me if I'm wrong, not so much on the uh, legal significance of immunity, as it's uh, called, when a state or a federal sovereign uh, constructs a building that would otherwise be contrary to zoning law, but on the p p particular terms of Section 2. I'm relying on both, Your Honor. I, I think Section 2, from my perspective, this presents the case as a matter of statutory construction. And Cambridge, through its counsel, adopted Section 2. And the building doesn't qualify under Section 2. So somehow that has to be avoided because the Cambridge Planning Board plainly ignored Section 2. And the land court uh, is supposed to defer to the decision of the local board, but not if it's unreasonable. And you recently had a case just last year, Palulu, 
in which the court said your, your deference is due to the board only if the board's interpretation is reasonable. The board's interpretation here flies in the face of its very ordinance. Now, let's just assume for the sake of argument that uh, Section 2 and 40A Section 6 are regarded as consistent in all respects with each other. That's what Justice Mendez, or Justice Cass said in the Mendez case. Uh, and your, your, your argument moves on to this issue of, um, uh, of how and when it became lawful. And your argument is that just as uh, an, uh, a structure that's not in compliance with the zoning law, uh, but for which a variance is granted, uh, doesn't Boot, cannot bootstrap itself into being a non-conforming use exactly. that neither can this courthouse by exactly. virtue of having been built under the authority of the sovereign. Exactly. Um, Justice Cass ruled in the Mendez case that a use authorized by a variance did not uh, obtain non-conforming status under Section 6 for the purposes of expansion. For him, the question was how and when did the use or structure become, un become lawful? And it, it, it doesn't meet the definition of nonconformity in section embedded in section six, as he explained it in the Mendez case. Now this if how, a it, was this how and when test uh, it doesn't uh, on its face uh, address uh, the argument on the other side uh, about how to interpret the Durkin case. And my question is trying to compare and, and reconcile Durkin and Mendez because. Uh, we all, as judges here, try very hard to ensure that our cases are consistent with each other unless we say explicitly that one overrules another. Uh, and Mendez doesn't even mention Durkin. Well, Durkin was before Mendez. Right. So, uh, so, so in trying to understand how these two can fit together, is it possible that uh, Mendez recognized that the test enunciated in Durkin could lead to consequences that were incompatible with the purpose of the zoning law, in particular Chapter 40A, Section 6, when uh, variances have been obtained and was trying to, in a, in a sense, differentiate uh, that situation from uh, the situation in, in Durkin. I don't think Mendez took into account the situation in Durkin. It didn't apply to the case, and I don't see that Justice Cass, in writing the opinion, would have, would have done that. But look at the cases that follow the Mendez case, in which others tried to obtain nonconforming status. This is a hard door to break down. Pallets under Chapter 41, Section 81L, an approval not required plan under the so-called Sitco exception can be used to divide lots, law, structures lawfully onto lots. Question is, what are those structures if the lots so divided don't conform? Answer, you need a variance. They're not non-conforming structures. Bruno, a court, a case that this court had, the use was unlawful and was simply survived the statute of limitations. Because Bruno it's, cites Durkin with approval. Yes, but Your Honor, when you go into the details of the Durkin case, as I've done in my exploration here, and I, I admit, a mea culpa, I was pinned down in the book for lack of this regard that I wrote. But no one has gone into the depths of Durkin and plumbed it like this before. Well, so the two land court cases and the Bruno case, I don't it's, think it's a case that, take that uh, into bears account. reading and rereading, and all of us, I think, have uh, had that experience. I don't think we'll, Noam we'll Chomsky it, could parse and, the and key we'll read provisions. It again. But your, your argument about how we should read Durkin is interesting because you're asking us, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, you're asking us to, to come to terms with Durkin based on the view of it taken by an administrative agency on remand after the case was decided. No, I don't That's think unusual. The, I, well, I don't think that the case, even if you, if you ignore what happened at the Falmouth Zoning Board of Appeals on remand, which effectively nullified any argument that it was decided on supremacy, I don't think that the language of Durkin is clear enough to establish that a, non, that a government building once decommissioned becomes non-conforming at law or, or, or in fact. The, look at the punctuation in Durkin. I think what the, the key provision is saying simply is that the building was non-compliant. So let's send it back to the Board of Appeals to decide how they want to treat it. And ultimately, they treated it as a classic non-conformity. The post office was allowed in 1959 when it was constructed in the agricultural district. The zoning changed in 1965 to residential. And the, the Board ruled, as I suspected that I would find on remand, that it was always a classic non-conformity. I, I want to keep well, going with the, with the Cumberland question. case. Excuse me, there's one other question. So, I'm sorry. Justice. 
when on remand they found it non-conforming, they, they did not rely on the sovereign authority? No, not at all. They relied on the fact that it was lawful in 1959 under the terms of the agricultural district, which allowed government buildings. That was changed in 65 to eliminate that allowance. And as a result, it was a classic nonconformity when Durkin remodeled it in the early 1980s. Well, before we move on, you said something else which I think is uh, uh, open to question, and that is that it was lawful when, this is now with reference to the post office in Durkin, it was lawful when constructed in 1959 because of that exception for municipal uses. Uh, the trial, your brothers disagree with that. The trial judge didn't agree with that either right. and took the view that a federal post office is not uh, a use that would fall within that exemption or exception? Well, I think the exemption was broad enough to include it. Um, let me just get the page here uh, of the precise language from the Cambridge Zoning Bylaw. The uh, all municipal purposes of the town, county, or commonwealth, including administration of government. That was the wording in the Agricultural District in 1959. I'm quoting from the Family right. Zoning Bylaw. So, um, it's municipal uses, but it's qualified by reference to state government. Or uh, including administration of government, and certainly a post office would fit well, into that uh, but, category. But before you get to administration of government, there's another phrase. State, county, or uh, municipal. I, I understand that, but I don't think that the judge in the land court reached that question. I don't, I don't know. To my reading of his decision, I don't think that he concluded that but it was But if we were allowed. to take the view that the way to read Durkin uh, is to take into account that at the time the post office was constructed in 1959, it was not uh, a use that was permitted under the zoning law. It may lead that, to a different view than the one you've urged on us. But that's not what the Falmouth Zoning Board thought on the remand either. Well, with all due respect, right. the, the Falmouth Zoning Board has its view, and we will have our view. I understand, Your Honor. Let me go on to ask, er, answer your question about the recently enacted Chapter 331. I think it buttresses the case because uh, of the case is, of is the plaintiff appellants. Is it effective today, in your view? Uh, I, I, that I can't answer, but I, I don't think it matters because I think it actually supports my argument. My argument is that to become a nonconformity, you have to break down the barrier in order to do so. Co uh, the uh, Pallet's case failed, Mendes' case failed, the Bruno case failed, and the Cumberland Farms case was the target of the recent enactment of the legislature. It said, and there are competing opinions of this court, compare Cumberland Farms with uh, Zitzkatz, which is an unpublished opinion, which says a, a non-compliant structure which survives the statute of limitation becomes a non-conforming structure. So I understand what the legislature did at the behest of the BVA. They clarified the inconsistent rulings of this court on point. But the, when you look at it, 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 it basically points exactly to my argument. To become nonconforming, you have to have an act of the legislature in order to do so. You can't just break out of the box of the classic nonconformity uh, framed by Justice Cass in the Mendes case. Um, that's consistent, most importantly, with the legislative history that this court cited most recently in Bruno and that the SJC cited in the Pallets case. Nonconformities are disfavored. We go out of our way to avoid them and what to prevent the, them. Uh, public policy arguments that are made by uh, some of the parties who have briefed this case, I think on behalf of the uh, Commonwealth, yes. that uh, uh, while nonconforming uses are disfavored, and that may be uh, a, a way of uh, understanding Mendez, that there are public policy uh, consequences of, of, of the view you take, uh, given the um, uh, extent to which uh, public construction projects could become uh, burdens and eyesores uh, that uh, would uh, diminish the quality of life in a particular area. I understand that, and I, um, I, I think it's ironic that that argument is being made in the case of the Sullivan Building, which along with the UMass campus was probably two of the more notorious breaches of public faith during this era of government. But um, I would point to the opposite argument. If this is true, then the government can go out and not only build ugly buildings, as I think we would all admit this one is, but they can also buy ugly buildings, and by virtue of waving the wand of sovereign immunity over it, of supremacy, reconvey it to the public sector as a nonconforming structure to be easily modified by a special permit instead of a variance. There's, there's a slippery slope uh, down the path that's being advocated by the Attorney General's office here. All right, you no other questions. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Thank you.
Are, are you folks planning to divide your time? Yes, Your Honor. All right, so would you tell us how you're going to do that? I'm going to go for about 12, Your Honor, and All then right. my colleagues, Ms. Buell and Mr. Hornstein, are going to go for like one and a half, I guess, or All right, two we'll and one. See I'm how that exactly works. Sure. All right, I'll try to. I'll try to uh, stay with uh, 12. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court. My name is Kevin O'Flaherty, and I represent the developer here, LMP uh, GP Holdings, LLC. Your Honor, I want to I address my comments to some of the questions you were asking. The first thing I want to talk about is the statutory uh, basis for our position. We believe that the, uh, the plaintiffs here are incorrect in saying that Section to the definitional section of the Cambridge Zoning Ordinance Controls. We believe and we submit and the land court agreed that it's really Mass General Laws Chapter 40A Section 6 and Sections 8.22 of the Cambridge Zoning Ordinance which are the controlling statutes. The definitional section, what Mr. Brabowski has uh, quoted to your honors in his brief and also here today, the defi definitions in Section 2 do not for lack of a better term, Trump, the, uh, the, the uh, 40A Section 6 definition of what a non-conforming structure is, nor does it trump what 8.22 says a non-conforming structure is. As you know, Your Honors, 8.22 of the Cambridge Zoning Ordinance specifically incorporates Mass General Laws Chapter 40A Section 6 into it. It is the protections provided for what we, you know, lay people call uh, grandfathered uses and grandfathered structures, which this courthouse is, and it incorporates that from the general law. So Judge Foster was right when he said this case turns first as a statutory matter on 40A Section 6. What does 40A Section 6 say? 40A Section 6 says any use or structure lawfully begun and lawfully in existence is a non-conforming structure or use which has the benefit and the protections well, of Mass General Laws Chapter 40A Section 6. I guess that's where they differ. They're saying that it was never a lawful non-conforming, it was just under sovereign immunity. You're saying sovereign immunity gives it that lawful. Yes, no. yes, Your Honor. It is not, it's very important, and I think we're all in agreement about this. The, the courthouse, when it was constructed, in 1968 to 1974 and was constructed in excess of 4 FAR, it was a 10 FAR. It was lawfully constructed. It wasn't illegally constructed. They didn't go out in the dark of night and throw it up there. They didn't uh, ignore the law. The law was the principle of governmental immunity which said governmental structures do not comply, need to comply with whatever zoning is in place. In other words, put it this way, Your Honors, think of it this way. A structure like that comes into being as if there was no zoning. There is no applicable zoning to this such a structure. And in fact, in that sense, it is like what Mr. Bobowski just described as the classic non-conforming structure. The classic non-conforming structure is a structure that gets built in 1800 and then zoning comes along in 1920 and the structure is non-conforming and it was pre-existing that way and the law does not apply retroactively to that structure. Why not? It goes to what Your Honor, uh, uh, Justice Agnes said a few minutes ago, because there were important vested rights that, that come into being when a structure is lawfully constructed. I guess what, what, they, what they argue is it was non-conforming. It's unlike where the zoning law changes. It was always non-conforming. It was always non-conforming, but it did not violate law, which is a difference. And that's where the Mendes cases and the Pallets cases are quite different than this case, Your Honor. That's where structures or, or uses which come into being under the grant of a municipal dispensation from zoning in the form of a variance are quite different than structures like this, which come into being under the principle of sovereign immunity. Uh, so, so that's the first major difference we have with the plaintiff's position here, and it is the, the difference that Judge Foster talked about in his decision, and he is absolutely 100% right that that's what Chapter 40A, Section 6 says. And we are exactly the kind of structure that 40A, Section 6 says is a non-conforming structure because we were legally begun 
and for 40 years have been legally in, in existence. The question for, for the court is, so what's the legal status of such a structure when it, stop, when it stops being owned by the government and that immunity, if you will, evaporates? That's the question. And the question is controlled by, it is answered by Durkin, clearly. Mr. Rabowski says Durkin is sort of a, a sloppy mess of a decision. I don't think it is, Your Honor. I think it's, it's, I understand Judge Foster said it wasn't the easiest one for him to parse through either. And, and, and I understand that. We've all spent a lot of time briefing it. My gosh, we spilled lots of ink on Durkin in our briefs. But Durkin really does come down to a very simple thing. Durkin comes down to the following. And this is, I think, very important for the court when it reads Durkin and construes Durkin. What happened in Durkin? Mr. Durkin bought this building that used to be a post office. Well, we, you can assume we know the facts. I understand, Your Honor. And so he went, to get a section, he went to get a Section 6 finding. What did the Falmouth Zoning Board of Appeals say? They said, we don't have the jurisdiction to give you a Section 6 finding because an immune use cannot be, cannot be a pre-existing non-conforming use. That was the Falmouth Zoning Boards of Appeal. That is the proposition that this court took aim at and shot down. This court said, no, Board of Appeals, you're wrong. It's at page 452 in the decision. You're wrong. A, a building or, which is used under the principle of sovereign immunity and by extension a building which comes into existence structurally under the principle of sovereign immunity is and can be a pre-existing non-conforming use. You do have jurisdiction over this if, if, and within Section 6 to give a Section 6 finding. You're wrong about that. And they sent it back to the board. Now, they sent it back to the board under some confusion about whether this thing was the classic case of pre-existing non-conforming use or whether it was a pre-existing non-conforming use uh, because of sovereign immunity. But that's irrelevant. The, cr the critical point is that this court in Durkin said a, 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 a use which comes into existence under the principle of sovereign immunity can be uh, a, a pre-existing non-conforming use within the, within the understanding and within the protections and processes of Section 6. And they sent it back down to the board and said, you decide which it is. But clearly, that's what Durkin held. And the, and the footnote in Bruno, footnote number 13 that we cite in our briefs, all of us, it says that exact thing. It's not exactly a ringing endorsement of, of Durkin. Well, a ringing endorsement, Your Honor, uh, I, I, perhaps not. But I think what it says is... It, it also makes reference to the fact that the, that, the, um, that, the, the, that the variation between what the zoning law required and, and what the building actually was was not significant. Now, it, it, there were two, two parts to that. But, but in the footnote itself, Your Honor, I, 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 my point is simple which is, it, it makes very clear that the issue presented here was the issue that the, this court decided in Durkin, that being that a, a use in the, in the Durkin case, but here a, a structure which comes into existence under the, under the if you will, the, the uh, uh, sovereign immunity uh, principle is and, and, and should be treated when it comes out of government use as a pre-existing non-conforming use. Um, so, so the case law, Your Honor, I think, also is very strong in our favor, as Judge Foster found. The, 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 last thing, the last piece I want to touch on is a little bit of the sort of policy stuff that, that uh, you, you talked with Who, Mr. Who's going to address today. the issue of the statute? What's that? Oh, someone else oh, is going to address The statute? That. Yes. Oh, I'll, I'll address that, too, okay. real quickly. Is it so, effective today? And if so, what okay. impact does Number that one, have on the case? Uh, it was signed on the August the 4th, becomes effective 90 days hence, November the 4th. I don't know if my math's exactly right. So you're, you're conceding that it's not a, a legislation that affects the power of the courts? Say that again, Your Honor? So you're conceding that it's not legislation that affects the power of the courts? Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not conceding that, actually. Because I would think make it, it becomes effective, effective and it's retroactive. That would make it effective in 30 days if it's not subject to the uh, referendum under Article 48. Uh, that, that I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, aware of, Your Honor. So I gather uh, your point is whether it's effective today or not doesn't really matter. So I, I think it's really something this court should take into consideration. And I come to, no surprise here, a quite different view of it than Mr. Babowski. The third paragraph of that amendment says, and I'm going to paraphrase, says that if, an, if a structure came into being, now listen, this is very critical, if a structure came into being illegally, illegally, in other words, 
it was built in violation of law or because of some mistake of a building inspector. So an illegal structure that exists for 10 years without any enforcement action being taken against it at the end of that 10 years becomes, for the purposes of this commonwealth, a pre-existing non-conforming structure. What does that mean? That means that a structure that was built illegally could end up in a better place than the courthouse, which was built legally. How does that make any legislative sense? It doesn't. And why? Because the, because the while this gets to the, the public policy, while the, uh, the, the, the law abhors is too strong to over the word, but it disfavors uh, nonconformities, the law also protects nonconformities. 40A Section 6 protects nonconformities. 822 protects nonconformities. Why? Because there are important vested rights that go along with those buildings that were lawfully put into existence, lawfully constructed, lawfully existing. And as Your Honor pointed out, this, is, this would devalue not just this building, this would devalue a host of buildings in, in, in the Commonwealth's ownership. It is not the result, as a practical matter, that ought to obtain here. It is not common sense that a building like this, which was legally built, can't be, can't be converted to a higher and better use. I think your time is up there. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Sir. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. May it please the Court, I am Valley Gillen for the City of Cambridge Planning Board. I'm going to be very brief because I want the Commonwealth to also have a minute. Um, the Board asks this Honorable Court to affirm the decision of the Land Court for all of the reasons set forth in the Board's brief, as well as for the reasons that have been argued by LMP today. The Land Court's decision upheld the authority of the Planning Board to make a decision that was within the Board's authority to make and that was consistent with the stated purpose of the Cambridge Zoning Ordinance to conserve the value of land and buildings and encourage the most rational use of land throughout the city. The special permits that were issued, issued by the board to LMP allow LMP to redevelop and use the courthouse building that, and will result in an improved structure that is more conforming to current zoning requirements than the existing structure. In issuing the special permits, the board applied the standards set forth in Chapter 48, Section 6, and Article 8.22 of the Zoning Ordinance in a manner that was neither arbitrary, capricious, or legally untenable, and for that reason it should not be disturbed. It's also important to note that under either version of Chapter 48, Section 7, no action can be taken that would require the dimensional violations of the courthouse building to come into conformity with current zoning provisions. Therefore, the fact that the structure is lawfully permitted to remain and be used as it is today only underscores the reasonableness of the board's decision permitting the alterations to the structure. For these reasons, the board respect respectfully asks the court to affirm the land court's decision upholding the decision of the planning board. Thank you. Thank you very much, and you've generously given 18 seconds <laughs> to uh, your brother, so he'll have uh, a bit more time. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honors, and if it pleases the court, I will greedily take that 18 seconds. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Commonwealth in support of the land court's decision and urging this court to affirm the decision below, both as, because it is right as a matter of law, and we join fully in the arguments that you've heard previously, but also as a matter of sound public policy. The Commonwealth owns, at present, approximately 5,500 properties throughout the state. Right now, on the order of about 150 to 200 of those are deemed inactive. An adverse decision in this case will have profound effect on the vested property rights of the Commonwealth and its taxpayers. It will prevent the Commonwealth from reselling its property or reusing its property at a fair market value, thus diminishing the overall capital assets of the Commonwealth and essentially resulting in a number of eyesores that are undevelopable, undevelopable or need to be raised in order to be resold. And to address very briefly plaintiff's comment that the, the Commonwealth would simply build ugly buildings and reuse them for public use under the magical wand of immunity, the Commonwealth is severely constrained in the types of buildings it can build and use. It can't just build buildings willy-nilly for private use. We cannot do so, and we do not do so, Your Honors. 
Lastly, since the Court asked um, Justice Agnes to answer your question, I agree fully with, uh, uh, with co-counsel uh, that the act that is cited in the 16L letter is not effective as of today, but it will be effective in approximately a month's time. And under the strict terms of that act, Your Honor, it is intended to be fully retroactive. And so uh, perhaps the Court makes a decision within the next three or four weeks and it becomes a non-issue. But to the extent, Your Honor, uh, a decision takes longer than that, and this uh, act goes into effect, by its plain terms, it essentially guts plaintiff's case, and it re would require affirmance on a separate ground, and we don't have to get into the business of trying to harmonize Durkin um, with all the other cases that have come thereafter. So respectfully, Your Honor, on behalf of the Commonwealth, I submit that the decision below ought to be affirmed, both because it is right as a matter of controlling case law under Durkin, um, but also on these separate grounds and as a matter of sound public policy. Hearing no other questions, thank you thank very you. much, Council. The case is submitted. Thank you all. Uh, court will stand in a morning recess.